Hosts are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon or good morning. Welcome to today's CFN webinar series. Today we have a pilot study of medication rationalization intervention. Today we're going to try something that we did in the last webinar series. Uh, we'll have a Q&A following uh, Dr. Downer's presentation, but if possible, we may have an opportunity in the last little while to have an open discussion. If you do raise your hand using the hands up uh, functionality and go to webinar, please ensure that you have audio uh, functionality on your end. Uh, we tried a few times last uh, webinar and a few people had their hands up, but they couldn't uh, actually, uh, nobody could hear them. So if you're participating by telephone, you must select telephone as your audio option and enter the code uh, displayed in the GoToWebinar to enable your functionality. And as long if you're online, um, as long as you have uh, speakers, um, you will be able to, uh, speakers and a microphone, you'll be able to uh, participate if I unmute you. So it, we'll try this if you have some questions during uh, James's uh, presentation. And if we don't get any, we'll answer your questions at the end of the webinar as time permits. And this webinar and the slides will be available online uh, within the next one or two days. And if you see in the red, you'll see that's where it is. So without further ado, I will present James Downer's background. He, uh, will be speaking today with his team and he will be introducing his team shortly. Uh, but James is a critical care and palliative care physician at U University Health Network and Sinai Health Systems in Toronto. He is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at U of T. He's the program director for the subspecialty residency program in palliative care at the University of Toronto, chair of the postgraduate education committee of the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians, and the Chair of the Ethical Affairs Committee of the Canadian Critical Care Society. He's also an Associated Medical Services Phoenix Fellow for 2016-17. And so I will turn this over to you, James, to start your presentation. Thank you, Carol. Can everybody hear me? And can everyone see my I presentation? I can hear you. Great. And can you see my presentation now? Yes, is there a way to expand it a little bit more? Uh, okay. okay, it's good. That, is that better now? Yeah. Okay, let me just see. Okay, wonderful. So, um, and is there an annoying box in the middle of it showing a link to the GoToWebinar? Can you see that? Yes, from my end, I see that. I'm, <laughs> I've ordered a new laptop because my operating system is woefully out of date, and I'm sorry. I, you're just going to have to bear with me through the presentation. I can't make that go away. Sorry. OK, and that's I, fine, James. And if something goes wrong on your end, I have your slides up to, to, to roll them forward. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, it's, it's, I'm expecting the laptop in the mail any day now. So um, anyway, I want to thank everybody for joining us on the webinar today and uh, for taking time out to, to hear a presentation of, uh, of the results of this study that was very, very kindly funded by the Canadian Frailty Network. It's a pilot study of a MIRA, the Medication Rationalization Intervention. Uh, I've, I put Rachel Whitty's name first because she prepared most of these slides and, uh, and then promptly went on our honeymoon. Um, and so she's not going to be able to join us for the presentation today. However, we do have with us the remainder of the, the core MIRA team. Uh, so we have Sandra Porter, who's one of the pharmacists uh, who was involved. We also have Karen Batu, who was one of the pharmacists who was involved. And we have Ellen Koo, who was a research assistant, who tirelessly roamed the halls, enrolling patients, and uh, dragging them into our study, uh, ethically, of course. And, uh, and so I just think it's really important to give acknowledgement to the, the, the hard work done by uh, everybody involved in this project. It was a team effort. 
So the objectives for the session really is to understand the function of a pharmacist-led team to rationalize medication use among seriously ill and frail elderly inpatients and also to appreciate some of the limitations and barriers to implementing a pharmacy-focused medication rationalization program on a hospital ward. Um, background, I think a lot of what I'm going to tell you is not going to be news to, to people attending this webinar, but most Canadians do die in an acute hospital setting and generally speaking they are not receiving comfort-focused care. Um, in particular, when you focus on medications, you find that medication use among the dying on an acute uh, care ward, um, medications are often mismatched to the care and the care preferences of the patient. So very often patients are receiving medications that could not conceivably be for comfort, even if the plan of care is for comfort. And when they are actually having symptoms, they're not receiving comfort medications to treat those symptoms. So again, a mismatch. We did a, a, a chart review some years ago at our institution and identified some very concerning patterns of medication use among those nearing the end of life. So this was 70 consecutive patients who were followed by the palliative care service and uh, either uh, these were patients who either died uh, or were transferred directly to a palliative care unit. So not, not a standard set of, of patients followed by the palliative service but really patients who were nearing the end of their life and had a very comfort focus to their care. Um, and we looked at the kinds of medications they were receiving just in the final week of their life or stay on the medical ward. We found that on the whole, and on average, these patients received 80 doses of medications in the final week of their life. And of those, slightly more than half could not have conceivably been for comfort. Um, these were medications that were given for either chronic primary prevention or other medications that really just could not have a comfort focus associated with them. And although many of these non-comfort medications were stopped in the final week of life, we found that a large number were actually started in the final week of life. So people continuing to treat um, with acute medications that were not focused on comfort, even if the, the plan of care was for comfort. And many of the stops that were taking place were actually just stopped on the final day of life uh, or discharged often when the patient was no longer able to tolerate oral intake. Moving to a broader topic of polypharmacy, we, I think, are, are aware among the frail elderly that polypharmacy is a big problem and it has important consequences. So about two-thirds of Canadian seniors are taking five or more medications and the more medications you take the higher the risk um, of a medication error, of medication interactions, of adverse drug reactions and non-compliance. I often love to tell the story about the one time I had to take a five-day course of levofloxacin. Um, I completely forgot about two doses of the five and of the three remaining doses that I actually took, I took two of them more than six hours uh, off of the time I was supposed to have taken them. So um, that's what I do with one medication. So I can't imagine people that have to take five or more, uh, how hard that must be to get that right. And when you look among the frail elderly who are receiving multiple medications, about 40% of them uh, on one study actually found that they were receiving inappropriate medications, medications that should not be given to an elderly person. So really, polypharmacy, a big problem. So deprescription uh, is often touted as, a, as a, a kind of a recent trend, a fad, if you will, and things that people are, are putting increasing focus on. There's a Canadian deprescription network. Uh, but there are many, many barriers to deprescribing, right? So many people have a poor understanding of the harms of medication use. Uh, people often overestimate the harms of stopping medications, certainly primary prevention medications, um, but uh, the, the harms of actually taking those medications tend to be underappreciated. There's tremendous concern about precipitating an acute event and balancing the risks and benefits uh, of, of using those medications. Um, and uh, sorry, one other thing is, of course, People often uh, are a bit afraid to stop medications, not so much because they are deeply attached to the medications, but they have a long-standing relationship with the doctor who started them. And the, the choice of whether to stop or continue that medication is less about the medication and more, more they feel it's more about a reflection of, of their relationship or how much they value the doctor who prescribed it. So it's very personal to, to many people. So there are a number of hospital-based pharmacy-focused interventions that are already in place that many, many uh, uh, of the audience would be familiar with that improve patient safety and appear to reduce costs. Examples would include antimicrobial stewardship programs, which uh, are, are rampant across the country and, and are, are excellent and, and appear to be very effective. And also medication reconciliation, which is now a best practice and a standard practice uh, required by Accreditation Canada um, in, in hospitals across the country. So 
our notion here was that we try to put together a few ideas um, uh, and, and form this new team of, of pharmacy-focused intervention for medication rationalization, or MIRA. So this would be focused on patients with advanced illness or a palliative philosophy. And what we would be trying to do is to deprescribe non-beneficial medications or, frankly, harmful medications, at the same time adding comfort medications should the patients have symptoms. And we would try to be involving, uh, try to be invoking evidence-based recommendations wherever possible, and always doing this with uh, the consent of the patients. So involving the patients in the process, understanding values, and making recommendations, and only making changes with their consent. The participants in the study uh, were pe uh, all patients on a GIM service at Toronto General Hospital. They had to have advanced illness and be at risk of a six-month mortality or elevated risk of six-month mortality using the CareNet criteria, which had been previously published. The intervention would be either to stop, change, or add medications that had a comfort focus. And then the outcomes, because this was a pilot study, were mostly pilot outcomes. Was, was this a feasible intervention? Was it acceptable to patients, family members, and, and also, importantly, the healthcare team? We were also interested to learn if it was going to be effective, would they actually stop medications, and was it time efficient, right? Would it be worth the time spent uh, going over these medications? So a bit of a process flow here. Uh, the study would be introduced to the patient, and then we would administer a survey that would include an ESAS, so we get an idea of their symptoms. And then a couple of validated uh, tests, so there's the beliefs about medicines questionnaire, and then the patient attitudes towards deprescribing surveys. So these are surveys in intended to look at patients' attitudes towards their medications and their, their overall willingness to stop them. Um, I'm not going to be presenting that data as part of this presentation, but it, it did, did make for interesting reading. The mirror review then uh, would involve our team looking at the diagnosis, the prognosis, the goals of care, and the symptoms. And then using evidence-based criteria, such as the STOP criteria, the START criteria, the BEERS criteria, Choosing Wisely Canada, Choosing Wisely USA, and some of our own algorithms make recommendations about stopping, changing, or adding medications to, to the patient's uh, list. Uh, we would then uh, gate crash the uh, internal medicine team meeting, suggest those changes, review them with the team, and then go on to propose them to the patient and substitute decision maker to see their input and see if they consent to the changes. And then finally, we give a summary report to them about the changes we made. Uh, and I'm sorry again for this box. It's quite, quite annoying. But the surveys, we talked about the BMQ, the PATD, and the ESAS. And I'm just giving you a bit of a screen grab of what our algorithm looked like. So we would have, for example, on the, we'd have a series of columns, and it was a master Word document, which was exhaustively compiled by uh, the pharmacists on the team. It took a long time. But they were able to put together all the recommendations for different categories of medications. And say, for example, um, uh, subtle cholinesterase inhibitors. And then we would have uh, next to them what the criteria were, what the recommendations were for STOP, BEERS, C WC and Choosing Wines of the USA um, to look at that. And then it was another column on the right that would be our own recommendations for how we were handling uh, certain medications uh, and recommendations that fell outside of the other sources of recommendation or evidence. We screened about 700 patients, and as you can see, well, um, <clears throat> uh, of those who met inclusion criteria and were ultimately found to be eligible, we got about half of them enrolled in the study. Some of them the team refused, some of them the patient refused. At times, we were unable to, uh, to reach the decision making and get consent, and uh, sometimes the patients were transferred out quickly or died, and we were not able to get their follow-up data. But of the patients that we did study, uh, this was just showing you the major demographics that you would be interested in. Most of the patients in this study, uh, frankly, met this sort of elderly, frail uh, type uh, pattern. So they were included for having age over the, uh, they, were, they were more than 80 years old. Um, a, a large proportion also, uh, a large portion had cancer and, and uh, some had end organ failure. It's entirely possible that some patients may have, uh, may have had more than one criterion. Um, or may have met more than one criterion. Uh, in that case, what we did was we said, like, uh, if, they, if they had cancer, uh, regardless classed as a, a patient with cancer, if they had end organ failure, regardless of, of their age, um, they were classed as end organ failure. And if they had neither cancer nor end organ failure, but were over the age of 80, they were classed as age over 80. Generally speaking, and just summarizing in a narrative way, the uh, uh, beliefs about medicines or medications questionnaire identify that, uh, generally speaking, these patients had more or less negative beliefs about their medications. They were concerned about the meds they were on. They did express a willingness to stop them. And I'm not going to go into details about that, but just that's the brief version. Um, we uh, tended to have a lot, of, uh, a lot to say about the medications the patients were on. So 96% of patients enrolled, we actually did make uh, a recommendation to, to stop, change, or add a medication. 
on the whole, there was a very high level of acceptance of our recommendations by both teams and patients. So uh, of, the, of the recommendations we made, 90% of those recommendations were agreed to by the GIM team, and 95% of those were accepted by the patients. So again, we weren't getting a lot of pushback on our recommendations. And on average, we, we made quite a few changes. So uh, we stopped about three medications per patient. We changed one medication per patient. And we didn't add as many medications as you might have thought. We only added about you know, one medication per five patients, but it was still, it was still uh, something that we did see from time to time. And that would typically be when patients uh, appeared to score highly on a symptom uh, on, on, the, on the ESAS. Uh, and maybe didn't have a pain medication ordered, or didn't uh, if they needed uh, sleep medication or appetite stimulation, that we would it's typically opioids or or um, uh, mirtazapine that we were suggesting. When we surveyed the patients or family members uh, about their experience with the team, we we got very positive results. So so here, just looking down the bars, um, they were asked to rate their agreement or disagreement with different statements. So you can see the top two refer to whether they found the team meeting stressful or confusing and you can see that you know sort of 80 90 percent are saying no they did not find it stressful or confusing then we asked them if they were comfortable starting new medications and stopping older medications and you see again a very sort of 80 90 percent comfort level with starting or stopping new medications uh, on the basis of those recommendations and and uh, you know more than 90 percent agree that they were they were glad that the team came to review their medications so a high level of satisfaction and acceptability to the patients so overall um, uh, and then of course we, we it was a mixed method study so we also had a qualitative researcher um, uh, following us looking at ethnography and also doing some focused interviews with uh, patients and family members. Um, the MIR intervention in particular was very well received uh, by patients who trusted their clinicians and by self-responsible patients. And just going to show you a couple of quotes from that. I'm sorry, again, I can only apologize so many times about the box. Um, but there was two themes that tended to come out from the patients and family members. That was the notion of trusting clinicians and then the theme of the self-responsible patient. So one quote would be, the bottom line was that I trust the doctors. They know the medications, and they know what's wrong with my mother. So this was a, a trust in clinicians, that that was a major underpinning of the uh, enthusiasm for this study and the, and the acceptability of, of our recommendations. And then there was a self-responsible patient who wanted to know details. So the quote was, you're in charge. I always thought of your body. And, even if he recommends me a drug, I want to know all about it. So, so these were patients that were uh, also very keen to participate in it, not so much out of maybe blind trust, but, but actually they kind of wanted to know more about what they were on and really go at each of those medications, and they appreciated the opportunity to really uh, talk about the pros and cons. So that was, uh, that was another type of patient. When we went to the medical teams and asked them about their experience, uh, there were two themes that came out. So one was related to the notion that this team was actually a really uh, powerful teaching tool and a great opportunity to teach uh, uh, trainees about deprescription and rationalization. So it was a great opportunity for teaching the residents about pharmacy, the evidence behind it, and the concept of a holistic approach. Um, at the same time, of course, anytime you ask people to do new things, there's always going to be some degree of pushback uh, related to time. So they said, it's just the time. We barely have time to do the teaching that we need to do, and to be doing that on top of it is added stress. So, you know, um, that there, were, there were some comments along those lines as well. Looking at what kinds of recommendations we tended to make, um, it, the top five are listed here. So uh, more than a quarter of the recommendations related to vitamins and minerals. So these are uh, often very large pills, and uh, you know patients are taking tons of these things, often in the belief that it is for primary prevention or other type of health benefit that is not in any way proven and, and, and in fact, contrary to guidelines. Uh, a large number were taking lipid-lowering agents, and they were perhaps in the final few months or weeks of their life from an advanced cancer. And now, of course, we have evidence that there is no harm to stopping those medications, um, even if uh, it was felt to be consistent with goals of care. Um, homeopathic and herbal supplements were fairly common. Uh, and of course, the, the dreaded proton pump inhibitor uh, would show up very often, and we were often stopping that medication. And of course, docusate, which uh, now no longer recommended by guidelines, given the fact that it doesn't appear to be any better than placebo at doing anything. So sorry, if you take these five recommendation classes together, that actually accounted for more than half of all of our stops uh, that we made were just in these five categories. We were able to follow through till discharge the outcome of medications that we stopped uh, on our mere intervention. So about two-thirds of the medications that we stopped as part of our intervention 
were, remained stopped and stopped at the time of discharge. But what was interesting is that though about a quarter of the time the medications we stopped ended up getting restarted at the time of discharge or at some point along the way. And it's interesting when you look at why. So here's an example of, uh, I mean, it, obviously medications could be restarted at discharge either intentionally uh, out of a change of heart or change of mind, perhaps we started stopped the PPI and the patient experienced a recurrence of uh, GERD symptoms or other um, dyspepsia, making them feel like they wanted to go back on these medications, and that would be one thing. But very often we found that there was a, what appeared to be an unintentional uh, issue due to the interface, right? So this would be one patient who had seven was on seven medications, uh, six of which we recommended to stop, and one of which we recommended to change the dose. Um, and you can see that all six of these medications were restarted, including, uh, you know, Advair and Salbutamol, okay, that might make sense, calcium, vitamin D, but psyllium was restarted and estradiol was restarted. So it was literally everything under the sun got restarted. And when we dug down a little bit, um, we, we, we kind of realized that this, our intervention was bumping up against uh, medication reconciliation. So discharge med rec, when people, uh, you know, uh, residents are often asked to prepare a discharge summary, sometimes for patients that they may not have been following the whole time in hospital, and maybe not following at all, and are just cross-covering and doing a quick discharge summary. Uh, knowing nothing about the patient. And there's an option in the discharge summary to say restart all admission meds, and it's an easy button to click, and automatically all these medications got restarted. So it's funny how uh, one pharmacy intervention actually got undermined by another, um, and all in the name of quality. So, so distinguishing medications that get stopped during admission deliberately versus uh, unintentionally um, is, is one potential issue that um, you know, a medication reconciliation cannot always, uh, cannot always drill down to. So in conclusion, we found that on the basis of our pilot results that the mirror intervention is quite feasible, highly acceptable by both physicians and patients, and effective at stopping medications. Um, there were some lessons learned, though, that there were, there were clearly some system issues that undermined our attempts to rationalize medication for patients. Um, we really should highlight the critical role of the pharmacist in, in medication rationalization. The idea that, that a lot of this background work was being done, that the, the reports were being prepared and the recommendations were being prepared in the background prior to a meeting so that at the time of the meeting, when the whole team is there, um, it only takes a few minutes to actually run the list with the, patient, with the team and everyone's like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But of course, there was a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that wasn't seen. And it's important to notice that this is distinct from medication reconciliation, so the processes that are going on by the time we're seeing these patients, they have already undergone medication reconciliation, right? So, so this is not a simply a situation of us stopping some medications the patient was never on. We, we, um, these were only patients who would have had Medrec done. So in terms of next steps, and, and this is where we're sort of moving forward here, um, we, the, given our findings, given the acceptability of the intervention, we wanted to look at ways to try to make the process more efficient, particularly the background work, which uh, was a fair amount of work uh, for the team. And so we were thinking, on the one hand, you could do actually a very simple automated screening system of the five most commonly stopped medication classes, and I showed them to you on an earlier slide. So just if you wanted to really get the big bang for the buck and just, just focused on those five things, that's more than half the work right there, and it could be done fairly quickly. It would save a lot of time and increase efficiency. Ideally, though, this is something that could very well lend itself to a computerized application. And uh, programming in these algorithms or ability to flag medications and prepare automatic reports for teams or team-based pharmacists that could go over and do this without the background work being done, because a lot of this stuff was algorithmic and rote. Um, and, and so we've actually, that was always the plan. And I'm happy to report that uh, the Canadian Frailty Network um, is funding a pilot of MedStopper, which is uh, something led by Todd Lee, primary investigator uh, from McGill. And um, CFN is, is funding a three-site pilot, including Toronto, McGill, and Ottawa, looking at um, a uh, medication computerized system, uh, computer me uh, computerized uh, system known as MedStopper. It's an application that can be run off of the web, but hopefully could also take pharmacy computer outputs and actually prepare automatic reports for uh, given patients that could then, those recommendations could be given to attending physicians and done in a more automated fashion. And we're going to be starting a pilot uh, in the next couple of uh, weeks or months here in Toronto and, and McGill and Ottawa. And of course, the, the really good news happened over the summer 
that this same intervention then for the sort of nationwide multi-center study uh, has been funded by CIHR. So there'll be a large, large, large uh, study looking at this. That, and, and one of the core elements, in fact, one of the core algorithms of the MedStopper program is actually uh, the table that, that we showed you earlier, the, the, um, the big algorithm that included, the table that included the algorithms for beers, stop, start, and choosing wisely, as well as the mirror algorithms. And uh, so really excited to see uh, that the, the stuff that was developed as part of this project uh, sort of getting some, getting to go prime time and go national. And, and the uh, ultimate idea being a standalone application, something that could work as part of hospital pharmacies, could work as part of outpatient pharmacies, could work as part of family health teams, that there's really um, a, a very broad applicability of, of uh, this type of intervention uh, and because it's automated with the potential to really impact care for a huge proportion of Canadians, particularly the, the elderly population of Canada who are so touched by this issue. Wrapping up, uh, got to once again uh, give tremendous credit to the entire MIRA team that was involved in this study. Uh, this was a lot of work. This was, um, you know, putting this together, particularly the background work, preparing the materials and the algorithms was really Yeoman's work. And I have to really send once again a big thanks to Sandra, uh, to Karen Batu, Pranjal Bat, who couldn't be with us, the, uh, the, the poor hapless uh, master student who, uh, who uh, landed uh, in this project and really took it, uh, the teeth between, uh, took the bit between his teeth and, and ran with it and has been tremendously uh, industrious in trying to compile the data around this. We're hoping to get actually some further follow-up data about what happens post-discharge and we've got that now. Uh, we've got permission to use Ontario's um, uh, drug profile viewer to look at uh, outpatient prescriptions going three months post-discharge to see the durability of our recommendations. Uh, the research coordinator, Ellen Koo, who's also here, our cultural anthropologist, uh, Shilla, who, was, uh, who um, you know, was running around and chasing people down and doing these interviews and did a great job. Uh, and, of course, the other physicians on the team uh, and the rest of the team, so Gary Wong, who is the pharmacy lead here at UHN, who was uh, instrumental in getting the local support, Dr. Rob Wu, Dr. Isaac Bogos, and Dr. Peter Wu, all of whom are internists uh, at TGH, <coughs> who were involved in helping support the project, and our project manager, Kendra Delicate, who works at Open Lab. Uh, thank you, Kendra, for all your patient hard work and help in, in putting this together and, and helping us with uh, some of the logistics of getting this thing off the ground. So, um, and of course, Partners in Funding, Canadian Frailty Network, the Pharmacy Department at UHN. Uh, we had a little bit of funding from the foundation of the hospital. We had um, uh, letters of support and, and uh, interest in, in, in uh, spreading the results from the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians, Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. I keep putting the and in there, and I'm sorry, Sharon Baxter, if you're on the, the webinar. I'm sorry. I, I should have taken the and out. There should be no and there. And of course, Pallium Canada <clears throat> with their LEAP modules, and, and I think they're, they're very interested in trying to take this knowledge and moving it out there as well. So I want to thank everybody for your attention, and uh, now I'm uh, happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks, Jane. That was an excellent presentation, and thank you to you and your team. And, and, and there's I, a few questions. Sure. Can I also just also point out, we have the, our pharmacy team members in the room uh, so if there are if there anybody wants to ask pharmacy specific questions, um, please feel free because uh, we have people here to answer them. Well, funny enough, the first question is how can community pharmacists play a role uh, outside the hospital? And so before they get to the hospital, um, their prescriptions are at the level they should be. Uh, that is a good question. It's actually a great question, and we, we only wish that... Can you hear me? Yes, I can. We only wish that we were able to provide the same intervention in, in the community or for this um, intervention to make its way into the hands of the community pharmacists and the patients, um, family physicians, and maybe that'll be a future goal. What we can say is that um, there is currently a medication review service that is offered to patients and our patients in this study would fit the cohort of patients that um, this service would be offered to and that's called a meds check 
And it would be our hope that when pharmacists in the community are doing med checks, these med reviews for their patients, that they're catching um, these medications and hopefully notifying the prescribers about deprescribing them. But that's, that's in terms of what already exists, that's about it. And, and I have heard of that. So my question is, um, do you look at prescriptions after the fact and let doctors know that there's something wrong? Or um, are you just having the discussion with the uh, person who's getting the medications prescribed? Because often in frail elderly, it not be the frail elderly picking up the prescription, but it would be their caregiver. Uh, so right now the meds check program essentially is is a bit of a review there it's currently undergoing a bit of a revamp in ontario though and so they are um uh we are going towards loftier goals with this in mind essentially with the thought that instead of just doing a review to make sure they're taking their prescribed medications properly that we are actually going through um uh, to make sure they all make sense for the patient as well. And so that's kind of, you know, a, 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 a goal, like it is a goal for us to do better in, in, our, in our intervention here. It is a goal for the meds check program uh, to, to, to work towards that. Um, as it is right now, for the most part, they do try to do a meds check with the patient themselves. So sometimes for the, the frail elderly, that does mean, you know, scheduling a time that they're able to come in as opposed to just, um, you know, catching them when they're picking up the prescriptions. Um, but I think that's a great opportunity, uh, like Karen was saying, to uh, take advantage of them being there. And the hope then is that they would communicate back to the prescriber if they had any concerns or suggestions about deprescription. I think that's a, a, a great opportunity for community pharmacists to do that. And it, and it is after the fact. So it's after a medication has been prescribed, unfortunately. That's when we intervene. And one, one thing I can just add, <clears throat> I think looking at how the process worked for this intervention, we had the luxury that all of the people, in, like most of the people involved in making the decisions were in the same room face to face when they were being discussed. So you had pharmacists, docs, and, and, and team all there so that if anybody had a thought about it, you could resolve that immediately. There was, it was synchronous communication. Uh, what did come up a couple of times is we were going to suggest that they stop, for example, a statin, and the patient would say, oh, well, I'm okay to stop it, but could you please clear it with my cardiologist? So then we'd have to send an email to the cardiologist, wherever that person is, or try to call them and discuss with them, and then there would be that sort of gap. I, I, I think that to some degree the challenge in the community is that if you're doing this, as you highlight, there's kind of three people in this interaction. There's the doc, the patient, and the, uh, the pharmacist, and you don't have all three in the same place at the same time. That's a challenge. Um, because when you're trying to do asynchronous communication, leaving messages on voicemails, etc., for a converse, what, what ultimately is a is a values-based, you know, sort of risk-benefit conversation, asynchronous communication is not a very efficient way to do that. So it's I think it, it highlights the point and, and the value of an intervention like this, where people do get that face time. And I think uh, it's it's a consideration to have when you're in the community. Yeah. Um, further to that question, um, I know you're saying that pretty near everybody has to be in the room for it to work very quickly. But um, as one of your pharmacists was saying, um, they're doing the first level at the community in Ontario. Do you know if that's happening in the other provinces? Uh, I personally don't. I wonder if anybody uh, okay. on our does could let us know because it's a good question. Hopefully somebody will, will answer that question. I guess the other place that, that where there is a lot of frail elderly is long-term cares and nursing homes. And has there been anything done in that area across Canada with, with similar to, to your study? So the, same, the very same intervention, the meds check, there is actually a, a meds check that's specific for long-term care patients as well. And it would be the pharmacist who is involved in dispensing medications for those patients who would be expected to review their medications. So again, it's a, a similar, very similar process to what exists in the community. There, there's also, I believe, another, I think it was another TVN or CFN funded project looking at this in long-term care. I think it was a survey 
Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the PI was in Hamilton. Her name is escaping me at the moment. Um, Carol, do you remember the details of that? Am I inventing this? No. Well, there's a there's one who's looking at in long term care home. I think it's Morrison um, or Morris, and it, it's one of our SIGs. And I think they're looking at specific drugs that keep uh, that are continually prescribed. And there's a certain group that they're looking at to to see if they're necessary. Right, and I think I think and, their so, I think their view is ultimately to try to intervene. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting, right? As you say, it's a it's an area where you have to think this has tremendous potential for expansion and use, right? It's, it's where the patients are, it's where the frail elderly are, and it's where the polypharmacy is happening. Yes, I, I think you're right in that case. And somebody's asking the question is, uh, are you working with anyone in Atlantic Canada on these types of initiatives? Um, and uh, do you think a nurse practitioner could take on the role of the pharmacist in a replication of this pilot? Um, we're not working currently with anybody in Atlantic Canada, but I remember speaking to uh, somebody who tried to, I think, get a project like this going and was encountering a lot of obstacles, really was unsuccessful, I think, in getting it off the ground due to sort of pushback from uh, clinical teams and, and an unwillingness on the part of patients and families. So it's very different than our experience. Um, personally, I, I can't see, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the training level and the, and the professional um, classification of the individual doing the intervention, I think is, is important, but maybe less important than the skill set and experience of the individual. Um, I, I think, you know, I think a physician could potentially do this if they were very knowledgeable about pharmacy and, and about pharmacy recommendations, but I don't think most physicians have that level of understanding. Um, I think that, uh, you know, having a pharmacist, particularly one who's used to working with patients, is, is, a, is probably the ideal person. I don't see why a nurse practitioner with an area of focused interest uh, couldn't do this job. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I agree with James that um, anybody probably could take this role on. Uh, we have some great resources we've developed and some of, like James said, some of it was just the, the routine going through uh, things that could be automated, uh, so implementing the intervention. And I think that can be done by anybody. The, the next step of, of making sure it makes sense for the patient, I think it takes a little bit more experience, but I think that anybody with any background in healthcare training could take it on um, who are comfortable with their patient population. So with more of a like shorter uh, lifespan, uh, palliative uh, or frail kind of patient in mind. Okay. Um, she also asked if, the, if you thought about a cost analysis for a national study. But is the CIHR grant that was received, is that a national? It is, it is a national, yeah. It's, it's a multi-year project of research. And it involves collaborators uh, from coast to coast. Um, I don't think it goes north, but it's coast to coast for sure. So, you know, I mean, I don't know. You were talked about um, what population MedStopper was aimed at, and I don't know if anybody's ever thought of it going down to, uh, if, if it's successful, getting it down to the individual and, and somebody going on the internet and being able to at least look at it uh, without um, medical intervention at that point. Well, I think um, I, 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 I did. Yeah, I think you you have to think about the patient population that you're dealing with, right? So, I mean, and then that's where the ethnography was really interesting, right? Because you're identifying these different patient populations. There's some who are just kind of almost blind trust in physicians, or will evaluate whether or not they take a medication largely as a reflection of their relationship with the prescribing physician. So, you know, a long-standing relationship with a the physician, they're basically going to do whatever this doc says and they're going to keep doing it until this doctor says they, they should stop it, regardless of what anybody else says. Um, there's also a certain set of people who are, I think, a little bit more autonomous, informed. I, I don't want to sort of put value judgments on one, one personality type compared to another. The, there are a certain group of patients who are very self-aware uh, self-responsible, 
and are very interested in taking responsibility for everything that goes into their body. And so I think the idea of, of putting this out there and, and flagging this and, and in more, more or less empowering patients to ask questions about their own medications and get it out there. Uh, I, can get, I can give you a little anecdote um, because this uh, project was profiled um, in the newspaper last fall and actually got, uh, was picked up by La Presse in, in Quebec. So John Muscadere and I, um, are, are, we appeared in a French newspaper. And so um, my wife, who's from, uh, from, her family is in Montreal, um, they read the article and immediately took this to the family doctor taking care of their, their grandfather, like, like uh, the, their sort of patriarch of the family, which triggered this very long interaction with the family doctor at the nursing home. Um, being confronted with all these various, does he really need this medication? Does he really need this medication? So I'm sure that family doctor wants me dead now. Um, but it, it was just it, as an example, the saying of how you market this stuff to individuals. I think it, it, it is an example of people being able to really question and say, you know, hey, do I need this? Because I think I think that does send a powerful message to physicians to know that actually, I think a lot of physicians would be surprised to learn how eager their patients are to stop medications, particularly as they become frail and other ones. Hmm, very interesting. And, and I guess uh, the, one of the questions is, um, what are the root causes for over-prescribing over in the first place? <laughs> or do you, do, you, do you even look at that? Because that's a pretty good question. We're on we're the closed bracket, not the open bracket. But your, um, your question is a very important one. There, I think there, there have been a variety of studies looking at why people prescribe as much as they do. But I think, you know, to, I, I, I would hesitate to use the term over-prescribing um, because at the time these medications get started, they often are very reasonable. And I don't think, I mean, a, a few medications aside, you very often will look at these medications and not say that, the, it's not that these medications are always dangerous. Um, otherwise, why would anyone prescribe them? It's just that often, you know, how things were at the start, they kind of get left on, right? Like people don't want to make the, the hard step is stopping things. Mm -hmm. So the classic example being the proton pump inhibitors that got started because somebody had uh, heartburn, you know, in the early 90s and uh, no one bothered to stop it ever since. Or, you know, somebody was put on uh, vitamin D and calcium when they were walking around, you know, dancing and, you know, involved in contact sports. Um, and then they got advanced cancer and got admitted with a high calcium level and somebody still got them on vitamin D and calcium. You know, they, it's not that the medication was wrong, it's just that the patient's condition changed and that's why it's important to do these sort of routine reviews of the medications. Karen, you want to add something? I would agree with James actually. So not very seldom do we see that our patients who are on 10 or 15 medications that all of them were started at the same time oftentimes they're started sequentially for different issues that crop up over time but I think that the larger issue is not why or how were they prescribed to begin with but um, whether or not they're ever reassessed and I think that that's the piece that's missing they're not reassessed as often as they should or could be that's right you know like statins uh, aspirin, a lot of these medications that are there for primary and secondary prevention, you know, or they may have been prescribed at a time when recommendations said one thing and then the recommendations changed. So, uh, aspirin being the classic example of primary prevention aspirin that we, you know, was all the rage back in the day and now is, is very much not the rage. Yeah, interesting. It looks like there's lots of reasons for it. And I, and I think that sometimes if you know, somebody starts a, a, a certain a drug and if they don't know what it's for, they can't say, well, you know, go back to their primary care doctor and say, could I still be taking this? And if you're given the information up front, you might know that you shouldn't take it if something happens. But by the time you've thought of that, you've forgotten what it is that, oh. you know, the reason why you should take off. And, and from, from being in the and, room during these meetings with the families and the patients, it was hilarious. I, again, I cannot emphasize how eager and willing these patients were to stop their medication. Like how prevalent is the belief that they are on too many medications and would love to stop them. And if there was the biggest regret, I mean, a couple of people were a little disappointed uh, or didn't, didn't necessarily love the experience. Um, but I would say the biggest regret we heard was that we didn't stop more. 
Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I, here's a, another question that's a little bit different: is is when you're doing palliative care and the medication is is that approach always taken into account that you review their drugs? Is that part of palliative care uh, best practice or? That's a very good question, and I'm going to give you two answers. So just remember that the 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 study I presented to you in the background, those were exclusively patients followed by palliative care, right? So that was those are the prescribing patterns in patients who were all were already followed by a palliative care consultant as an inpatient, right? So just to show, I mean. Technically, that is something we're supposed to be looking at, but the guidelines around deprescription are, are not a core element of palliative care sometimes, and it's not a major part of teaching. It's not, uh, it's probably something we could be doing a much better job with, and studies, like, th this is not the only thing, many studies are showing this as an example. But the flip side also is that of the 60 patients that we studied, or 61 patients that, that we ultimately studied, only about five or six of them, I believe, were already followed by a palliative care service. But even though these, this represented a very high risk inpatient population, it was actually quite, uh, um, it, the vast majority were not followed by palliative care. And um, I believe seven or eight times um, part of our assessment, we actually recommended a palliative care referral because of the overall situation. Either the symptom burden seemed very high or the patient's condition seemed appropriate for a palliative care referral. And the team actually refused a palliative care referral almost every time, one or two times out of the seven or eight, that they actually followed our recommendation for a palliative care consultation, which shows you that this is an intervention, I think, that has uh, certainly applicability within the palliative care population, but it, it extends beyond that because this is more about not just those followed by a palliative care consultant, but those for whom a palliative approach more broadly may be relevant, even if you're not, quote unquote, uh, in the palliative care pool because you're not followed by a palliative care physician. Um, and, and to see that patients were willing or, or teams were willing to adopt a deprescribing approach and a rationalization approach, but not willing to send somebody formally to a palliative care doctor, I think speaks to the separateness of the issue here. Hmm. So just another question about what's out there in terms of technologies, um, uh, in terms of pharmacists being able to monitor across Canada what actually individuals are on with various different types of drugstores. I know there's some, but how far along is that, or uh, since you have pharmacists in the room, um, is there anything that you can see the whole patient uh, if they're going to three or four drugstores, if they're not one of the major drugstores? So, so unfortunately, we can't speak to a lot of the rest of the country. I know the Ontario practice well. I know that other provinces have differing practices and, and, and won't stumble my way through um, and get wrong on what I don't know. But I know that in Ontario, um, each individual drugstore has its own uh, medication list and actually even the big drug stores are not so if you go to a different shoppers drug mart versus another one or a pharmacy or whatever the case may be they don't actually have we've, we've improved that a little bit by having some uh, for example narcotic monitoring systems so it prevents duplication of therapies etc um, but there is there is no way for a pharmacist actually to look at a complete patient list unless they're going to the same pharmacy regularly, which is one of the things we really try to advocate, especially on an inpatient basis for our, for our patients when they leave, to try and um, empower the, the community pharmacist to actually do some of this work. I know that in some other places in Canada, there are a little bit more complete electronic health records across the province um, and some databases. Now, how much the, the pharmacists have access to and not, I'm not clear, so I won't speak to that. But it's definitely one of the major limitations uh, of a pharmacist, a community pharmacist-based intervention, which is why making sure that patients understand that and understand the importance of the continuity of a single pharmacy, uh, allowing that pharmacist to be part of their care in that way is really important. Mm -hmm. So that really involves the patient being on board to be able to do that. Hmm. Interesting. Anything else that I've, I think that we've answered most of the questions today other than 
you know, what would be the next steps other than MedStopper that you think uh, should be focused to um, get this um, prescribing uh, initiative across Canada? So to some degree, I mean, you know, where there, there are two issues. One is technical and one is cultural. So the technical issue around making this process faster and more efficient is, is what MedStopper is about and making this something that could be done hopefully by anyone anywhere uh, who has access to the interweb and the computer. The cultural issue is perhaps the bigger one, which is that you have to, you know, to, to quote the old joke, the light bulb has to want to change. If we're going to be, you know, before, before someone even starts punching medications into a computer, there has to be a belief that this is the right thing to do. You have to accept that there are situations when these medications, now, they may be harmful, and that's definitely good to stop harmful medications, but more broadly, if it, that you're getting close to the end of your life, and that when you get close to the end of your life, um, you know, if you're taking a medication where the number needed to treat is, you know, 0 15,000, maybe, maybe this isn't something you need to take in the final year of your life or, or final five years of your life. Um, and, and you can potentially avoid problems by deprescribing it. That's an issue for patients and families to accept. It's also an issue for physicians, you know, from longstanding cultural practices that they put people on medications that they swear by and genuinely believe in that they have to be able to come to the point of being able to let go and, and recognize that there's a point at which their medications are not so much futile but just not relevant to the reality of the patient. So I, I think if you never, you never want to end your study with, you know, future lessons are we just need culture change uh, because that's a really dumb uh, plan. If your plan is culture change, you need a new plan. But I think it's part of choosing wisely and getting the idea out there um, in standard medical practice and in common parlance that we, there are a lot of times when less is more and, uh, and, and this is one of them. And, and I think that's part of a struggle that we as a society are continuing to face and will continue to face over the coming generations. Yes, that's, I think you've nailed that right on. And I think, um, you know, for our frail elderly, when they're um, living longer, maybe with not the highest quality always, and having more adverse effects, it certainly would improve the quality of their life um, if they're on the right medications and, and minimizing the adverse effects uh, so that they don't, you know, yeah. get dizzy and fall or something that perpetuates, you know, more health care um, and more um, distress in their lives. Yeah, I mean, 30% okay. of the patients who are offered enrollment refused, right? So we've, we've got to do something to target that population. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't, we can't change it in a day, but it sounds like you guys have made great strides in, in starting the discussion, and there seems to be uh, an increasing interest in this area. So thank you very much for presenting today for you and the team. Uh, hopefully, um, the CIHR, are you part of that too, James? Uh, yes, we part are. Of we, the... we are, all of us. And um, Peter Wu is taking over as the sort of site lead here. Um, and, and at TGH, but the <clears throat> broadly, I think it will involve sites across the country, as I, as I mentioned before. So exciting times. Yes, that's that's uh, yeah. That's all we can hope for is that that we just keep improving. Um, so again, um, after this um, uh, uh, webinar. Um, you'll have some questions that will come up uh, that we could hopefully answer so that we could improve the webinars. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, people who were able to put their hands up today, so unfortunately there wasn't as much discussion, but I think your team did a great job of uh, um, providing some really good discussion on this area. 
Um, upcoming webinars, um, we do have one uh, from Franz Laguerre from the University of Laval, and we're just trying to get a date because the date that we had for her originally uh, falls within uh, the conference of AIDSWELL and CAG. Um, so stay tuned for that, and we'll have that date up as soon as that's confirmed. And we have another one Wednesday, November 16th with Michelle Coe, which um, is clinical trial of bed cycling in elderly mechanically ventilated patients. Um, so just again, the webinar slides, you'll see in red um, where they are, and they should be there between uh, 24 and 48 hours. So thanks for joining today, and thanks again to the team and yourself, James, for presenting. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent presentation and discussion today. So with that, we'll sign off. Thank you. See Thanks, you next guys. time. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.